What we're going to do now is we're going to do a quick review on everything you should know about infection control or infection prevention and control. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at, well, what is infection control? What is infection prevention? And what it is, is basically a, it's a program that's implemented in a, in, in a dental setting. And the goal or the objective is to prevent any infections. Okay, and so when we do a sepsis, when we sterilize, when we disinfect, when we wipe down, when we um, tear down the room and when we set up the room, we're being very mindful of a sepsis. We're being very mindful of um, infection control because what we don't want is we don't want anyone to get infected. We don't want anyone to get sick. And um, sometimes we don't realize this, but injuries also fall under infection prevention and control. Think about um, when you have a sickle and you, if you poke yourself with that sickle, that, that's an issue. We, that's a concern because now you can get sick from that, especially if it was a contaminated instrument and it had blood and that blood was from an infected person, someone who had hepatitis, someone who had HIV, someone who had COVID. So... The goal, again, of infection control, of infection prevention and control, is we want to make sure that we don't give anything to our patients, that our patients don't give anything to us, or that the patient doesn't give it to the next patient. That's why we, we clean and disinfect the room and sterilize the instrument so that it doesn't get passed down to another patient right after we see that patient. We want to make sure it doesn't go to the next patient. So that's why it's so important to do infection control or to follow infection prevention and control concepts. So question for you, all of the following are components of a personal a personnel health and infection control program except one. Which one is the exception? Is it A, infection control education and training for staff? Is it B, appropriate immunizations for vaccine preventable diseases? Is it C, exposure prevention and post-exposure management strategies? Or is it D, non-work related absences from illness? So the answer is D. Let's look, look at all the options and go over it. So infection control education and training for staff. That is essential. We need to train all our staff and we need to make sure we are fully educated on the importance of infection control. Immunizations, that's important because um, we need to make sure that we're vaccinated so that we can protect ourselves, whether it be hep B vaccination, whether it be uh, the influenza flu shot, whether it be the COVID um, vaccine, we need to be vaccinated. Exposure prevention and post-exposure management strategies. So we're going to look at lots of strategies that help with prevention uh, prevention of infection, with prevention of getting poked by a sickle. But this one right here, D, non-work-related absences from illnesses, well, what the infection control program can look at is work-related absences from illness. So if you got poked by an instrument and now um, you're sick, that is work-related. But non-work-related, if you got hurt outside of the job, well, that is not part of the infection control program. So non-work-related is not a component of the um, infection control program. But work-related is so when we're looking at infection control concepts, what we really need to do is we need to first see well, what procedures are we performing on our client? Are there any risks that we do or that we perform for these clients? And if there are any risks, what can we do to um, make sure that no one gets sick? What, what measures can be um, implemented? And so that's, that's, what, that's how they come up with all these infection control guidelines because they look at these questions and then based on those questions, they decide what is the best way to keep everyone safe. Now here's an important point. Infection control is procedurally based, not patient based. So what does that mean? This means that um, if your client states that they have HIV, then we're going to make sure we do we implement infection control. Well, that statement is false. We assume that everyone has HIV or we assume that everyone has, co or has um, hepatitis. We assume that everyone is sick. And because we can assume that everyone is sick, then we're going to treat everyone um, the same. And there's something called standard precautions, which we'll go over. But with this statement, infection control is procedurally based, means that depending on what you are doing with our client, with the client, we will 
implement or we will wear um, or we will have different strategies. So for example, think about aerosol generation, generating procedures versus non-aerosol generating procedures. So we know now with COVID, with aerosol, AGP, aerosol generating procedures, so like if you're polishing, if you're um, using a piezo, if you're using a cavitron where there's lots of aerosols in the air, we have to use specific guidelines. So with AGP, you might have to you have to wear an N95 mask, for example. Um, you would have to have closed doors, for example. But with non aerosol generating procedures, you don't have to maybe wear an N95 mask. Maybe you don't need to have closed doors. So follow the regulations. So that's why infection control is procedurally based. If you're using aerosol generating procedure, you're going to use different. Um, strategies or different con um, control met methods, whereas no uh, with non-aerosol generating procedures, it's going to look different. So it's not patient-based. We're going to assume that all patients are sick, but it is procedurally based if we're using aerosols versus if we're not using aerosols, for example. So standard of care, this is a word that comes up often, and standard of care, what that really means is our is we have a duty to provide a reasonable amount of care to our clients. So for example, if a client comes in with perio, it are, it's our duty to make sure we um, educate our clients on um, periodontal disease. It's our, it's our duty to um, educate our clients on how to properly brush and floss, and it's our duty to also debride uh, their mouth and um, make sure that we can reach optimal health. So we have like a, a duty and our duty is our standard of care basically means that we're going to provide a level of care that is reasonably um, acceptable. And who decides what the standard of care is? Well, um, your dental, we can look at it to so dental practitioners. Our boards can look at it, the government agencies can look at it, research, so evidence-based guidelines can look at it, infection control regulations, so all of them together decide on what the standard of care should be. Now, when we're in a dental setting, there are many different ways that the disease or the bacteria or the virus or the microorganism can get spread to us. So for example, it could be direct contact. So if we um, if there's blood in our client's mouth and we're not using gloves, for example, and we touch that blood and in our on our hand we have a cut, well, that blood could seep through our cut. So that's direct contact. It can happen through kissing. It can happen through skin-to-skin -skin contact. It can happen through sexual intercourse. Indirect contact, this is where you're not um, touching the face or mouth, but what's happening is it's being touched through an instrument. So your bare hand touches the instrument or your bare hand touches the light head or your bare hand touches like the, um, a surface near uh, in the dental operatory. That's indirect con contact when you have touched a contaminated object. You could also um, get sick through droplets or spatters. So if someone sneezes, if someone coughs, and you know how there's droplets that just come out, I'll have, I'll have a picture later on to show you that. If those droplets spread, you could get it by just uh, breathing it into it. If you rub your eyes, um, you can get like an eye infection. Um, it could even go into your mouth and then you could get sick that way. And it could also be airborne. So there are several diseases that are airborne. They're saying um, COVID is now airborne. Uh, TB is airborne. So there's lots of um, measles, mumps, those are all airborne. There's like uh, particles in the air. And if you breathe those particles, you could get sick too. So many different ways that we can get sick. Now this slide over here, it talks about well, how is how is that happening? What is the chain of reaction? What is the chain of transmission? What's ha what's happening first? What's happening second? What's happening third? And so on. So let's actually look at that. So the first thing that happens is that if there's an infectious agent, so if there's a bacteria, if someone is sick and, there's a, and they have a bacterial infection, if someone is sick and they have a viral infection, if someone is sick and they have a parasite uh, type of infection, that's the agent. The agent is what the infectious agent is what um, bacteria, viruses, or parasites they, someone has. The reservoir, this is where the germs are living. So this is germs, okay? And then reservoir, where is it? Where are the germs? Is it in people? Is it in animals? Is it in food? Is it in soil? Is it in water? So reservoir means where is it? 
portal of exit. This is what, how are the germs going to get out from that person? So let's say it's a, someone, ha let's say I have it. Let's say I have a virus in me. How can I spread it? What's the portal of exit? How will I, it leave my body? How will the germs get out? Well, it could come out from my mouth. Um, I could sneeze, I could cough, I could vomit, I, could, I have saliva, if saliva gets mixed uh, with someone else, uh, someone else touches my saliva, someone else touches my blood, uh, that's how it can be passed through. Mode of transmission, well how, um, how can I get, how can, how can you get the virus, how can you get sick? Well you could touch me, you could uh, touch my hands, you could touch my toys, you could touch the sand, you know, you could, um, if I speak and you're near me, if I sneeze and you're near me, if I cough and you're near me, that's how you can catch it, through droplets. Um, portal of entry, well how, now, how will the germs get inside you? Well, the germs can get inside you from you just breathing it, so from your mouth it can get inside you. Um, if you have cuts in your skin and I touch your hand and I have bacteria or virus, and that bacteria or virus can get seep into your uh, cut hand. So that's portal of entry. It can even get through your eyes if you rub your eyes and there's particles around um, the air and you know you can get sick that way too. So there's many ways it can enter our body. And then you have to be a susceptible host, you mean you, which means that you, you'll be the person that gets sick. This is the next sick person, susceptible host. It could be babies, it could be children, it could be seniors, it could be people with a weak immune system. Honestly, even with COVID, it could be anyone. So a susceptible host is someone that is at risk for getting sick. So let's look at this example here. A blank is not a link in the chain of infection. So when we're looking at this chain of transmission or chain of infection, what is not a chain of infection? A, pathogen in sufficient numbers. B, mode of transmission for the pathogen. C, immune host. Or D, portal of entry into new host. Well, A is an option, pathogen in sufficient numbers. Pathogen refers to the infectious agent. So pathogen is something bad, a disease causing agent. Okay, something pathogen is like a bad thing, a bad bacteria, a bad virus, a bad parasite. So if you need a pathogen in order to get sick. Mode of transmission. That's important because we see that here. Mode of transmission, what does that refer to? That refers to, well, how did the germs get in me, right? It could be through uh, touching, it could be through droplets when I'm, when, you're, when, I, when I'm speaking, when I'm sneezing, when I'm coughing, that's how um, it can get transmitted. So that's not an option. Portal of entry into a new host. Well, portal of entry is part of the chain of transmission or tra chain of um, infection because portal of entry means how did the germs get in you? Did it go in through your mouth? Did it go through in through a cut in your skin? Did it go in through your eyes? But this one over here, immune host, well, that's your answer, immune host. The chain of infection only happens to people that are susceptible. If you are immune to a, a disease, if you are immune to an infection, you won't get sick. So this is your answer. It has the answer is actually if it said susceptible host, it would, you know, be part of a chain of infection. But because it didn't say susceptible host and it said immune host, that is um, incorrect. Okay, so it, it goes to people that are not immune. So infection control principles. There's four things that we must. Um, follow. We must stay healthy. So we must be immunized with hepatitis. Hep um, there are like influenza shots are recommended. COVID vaccinations are highly recommended. So we must be immunized to keep ourselves healthy. We must perform hand hygiene. So we must wash our hands. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, we must be educated and we must train um, our new staff. We should also avoid contact with any blood or other infectious body substances. Avoid direct contact. So make sure we're wearing gloves, make sure we're wearing a mask, make sure we're wearing safety glasses, all gowns, all those are very important so that we don't visit, we don't touch those blood or saliva. Make client care items safe for use. So we gotta clean, we gotta sterilize, we gotta disinfect everything that the clients are using. And then limit the spread of blood and other infectious body substances. So what does that mean? And well, that means we're gonna disinfect everything. We're going to make sure we have barriers so that it doesn't get, um, it's just easier for us to limit the spread that way. Um, we're going to make sure we have a sharps container so that we don't get poked with anything sharp and in anything that is uh, contaminated, we don't poke ourselves with. So these are essentially the four things we need um, to make sure that we are following infection control. 
Let's look at this question. Which of the following is the most effective and efficient method to protect dental health care personnel from occupational risk? Wearing gloves, using safer needles, obtaining immunizations, taking part in training. So all of these are great options, but the answer is C, obtaining immunizations, because that is the most effective, and that's what it's asking, the most effective way to keep ourselves um, you know, safe is by obtaining immunizations. It is um, immunizations substantially reduce the number of um, the number of uh, us being susceptible to diseases. So in fact, so immunizations is extremely important, and that is your answer. Now, when you get uh, immunized, these are the recommendations: we should get immunized from Hep B. We should get immunized from uh, we should do the influenza shot, MMR, and these are t like this stands for measles, mumps, and um, rubella. And typically, we get that done when we're uh, babies. Tetanus, I'm actually due for that. That's, this is like every ten years, I need to get a boost. You need to get a booster shot for this, so I'm actually uh, due for that. That was a reminder for myself. Now, if you are sick, let's say you have diphtheria. Diphtheria is like a bacteria. It's a really uh, bad bacteria. Um, and what happens is if you get infected with this condition, uh, it creates toxins, it creates poison within your body and you can get really sick. Now, this is not common in um, developed countries, but it is common in developing countries. So it, you're contagious if you have this, so don't work. Um, if you have mumps or measles and you're not vaccinated, or you're not immunized, don't work because it's, it's contagious. If you have Hep A, uh, again, Hep A is very contagious, don't work. So don't work um, on clients. If you have upper respiratory infection, so if you're coughing, if you're sneezing, if you have a fever and you have all those upper respiratory infection symptoms like cough, sneeze, um, congestion, then don't work with anyone that's medically compromised because you don't want to get them sick. Okay. If you have shingles, so you can work, you can continue to work if you have shingles, but just make sure you cover all your lesions, okay? So you, you, you protect yourself and others by covering your lesions. So if you have shingles, you could work, just cover your lesions. And if you have HIV, then uh, talk with your doctor about how you can go about it because you can, it's not, this doesn't mean you can't tweak clients, um, but there are ways uh, how, on how you can and just talk to your doctor. So we used to hear the word universal precautions, right? And we're like, universal precautions means that treat everyone the same. Well, that term, universal precaution, has now been changed to standard precaution. And the way, the reason why they did that was because universal precautions only referred to to bloodborne pathogens. So if you are working near blood, um, you want to make sure that you protect yourself and your and your client by using universal precautions by wearing a mask by sterilizing by disinfecting by doing everything um, that you're supposed to do in a dental clinic but the, the standard precaution is more broader so standard precaution also looks at but you know protecting yourself from droplets protecting yourself from airborne transmissions so universal precautions only looked at bloodborne pathogens whereas standard precautions is more broader because it's looking at everything that could possibly make you sick not just blood so the thing to take home from this slide is that we use standard precautions no longer known as universal precautions um, and standard precaution means that we're going to treat all clients regardless of whether they are healthy or unhealthy because we you know sometimes that the clients won't tell us what type of disease they have they're not let's say they do actually have hiv they're not going to want to tell us so therefore we assume that all clients are infectious and so we're going to um, wear our appropriate ppe we're going to sterilize and disinfect a certain way like a the same way rather for everyone so question for you again all of the following are true regarding standard infection control precautions except one which one is the exception so i'll let you read that and then you tell me so the answer is d standard precautions apply only to exposure to blood well no it doesn't it doesn't only apply to exposure to blood it also applies to um saliva so any other bodily fluids it also applies to when you um, have non-intact skin so when you have a cut skin and you get um, bacteria, viruses, or any pathogens you know, entering your skin. Or it can even happen through droplets or contact. So you know, when you're sneezing and you're coughing and you have droplets that come out, it could also be spread that way. So it is not just blood. So let's look at the difference between contact 
droplet and airborne. Contact is when you touch something. So if I touch you, for example, and um, like I shake your hand, for example, you could get COVID that way. Um, droplet is if I didn't have a mask and I, you know, cough or sneeze, you could get sick that way. So this is droplets, like big particles. Airborne is when you have really tiny particles, like less than five microns, like really tiny particles that are just suspended in the air and you just breathe that air in, you could get sick that way. So many ways you can get sick through touching, through droplets, like with sneezing and coughing, or through airborne precaution, airborne, um, which is like this transmission where you have tiny particles in the air. Did you know that if you have someone who has an active TB, so they're sick with tuberculosis, TB, we cannot treat them because they are very infectious, uh, they can be infectious um, and contagious rather. And if you have someone with TB, we actually do treat them a little differently in that we'll, what we will do is we will, um, refer, if your client needs urgent treatment needs, there are sp special facilities that are out there that have a respiratory protection program in their, you know, in their unit. And so we would recommend them to go there. So there are specific units that can cater to those individuals that have TB and need urgent uh, dental treatment needs because our dental unit may not be able to accommodate them because they are a little more, um, they're considered a unique case where you need to treat them in a, in a, in a special manner. If a physician states that TB's, that your TB patient is no longer contagious, then is it safe to provide electric treat, uh, elective treatment? Is it safe to provide elective treatment but N95 should be worn? Is it safe to provide elective treatment but only in a TB isolation setting? Or should we wait three months to schedule elective dental treatment? Well, the answer is if your doctor tells you that the TB is no longer contagious, then yes, you can provide elective treatment in a regular dental office. Because typically what happens if, some, if a doctor says that uh, the patient is no longer contagious, that, that typically happens within 2 to 12 weeks after they first got infected. So TB, let's say I got TB, within, I could no longer be contagious any time from 2 to 12 weeks. So the doctor would tell you, um, you know, if that person is contagious or not contagious. Health history is so, so important because in a health history, they usually tells us that the clients will usually disclose if they have any infectious diseases. But again, as we know, clients may not. That's why we use standard precautions. And just as an FYI, again, as someone who has active TB or if you think someone has active TB, um, make sure you get them to wear a face mask right away. Make sure you uh, contact their doctor to see if they actually do have TB or if it's not no longer there. Because if they do have TB, you can't see them and they need to be treated. If it's urgent dental treatment, they need to be treated in, um, in a TB isolation setting. Okay. Which of the following is an example of an engineering control? So I know we haven't looked at this term yet, engineering control, but if you had to look at all these options, what would you guess? Education and training, B, sharps container, C, using a one hand scoop technique to recap a needle, or D, hand washing? So the answer is B, a sharps container. Engineering controls are basically the main method to reduce any exposures to uh, to blood or to any other infectious material that you can get from sharp instruments and needles. So they're there to protect you. So, and it's, it's something made, man-made, that is there to protect you. So education and training is not necessarily man-made. Hand washing is not necessarily man, it's not man-made, it's not an engineering control. But a sharps container, that is a great example of an engineering control because that will protect you from getting hurt. And it is man-made. Using the one hand scoop technique to recap a needle is great, but it, and it's a good strategy to uh, prevent yourself from getting poked, but it's not an engineering control. Because an engineering control, if we go to the next slide, is a device, okay? It's a device or an equipment that is made that is used to reduce or eliminate a hazard. So here are some examples, a sharp container, because that will prevent you from getting um, poked with an instrument or a needle. There, there is even something called the um, 
a shielding mechanism. So there are syringes and needles. So if you look at this, this right now, if you look at this needle, it has a cap, right? And then what they do here is they push down on this cap so that the needle is exposed. And then once they've used it, what happens is they just slide it back up so that you, so instead of it, you know, you have it to cap the needle, you could just slide it back up and now it's, there's no risk of puncture to you. So um, another thing, as, as a side note, one of the important things to do is if you don't have that that shielding mechanism in your needle, in your uh, syringe, then use a one-handed scoop technique. Never use two hands. So you take this with one hand and you scoop it up and you close it that way. If you use two hands, if you have another hand where you're holding the cap, you can easily puncture yourself. So that's why we always say use a one-hand technique. Another thing to also keep in mind is that we talked about never recapping needles by hand. Um, another thing is never wipe instruments on a gauze in a hand or wrapped around a finger. So I've seen this so many times where students will wrap a gauze around their finger or put it, a, a gauze in between their fingers and then if their um, you know, sickle or curettes or whatever is uh, dirty, they'll just use it, will wipe it on the gauze that is on their left hand. Or right hand depending on what their dominant hand is that is really bad because you can easily poke yourself with that and you want to do everything you can to protect yourself uh, by not poking yourself so there are these things that are out there and this is really cool it's called a sp uh, sponge device a safe wipe or a sponge device where you it just sits there and you just wipe it that way so that way you're not coming in contact with your hand PPE is part of infection control we wear uh, mask, we wear face shields, we wear protective clothing like gowns, uh, lots of PPEs that we do consider. Which of the following is not usually worn as PPE when spatter of blood or bodily fluids is anticipated? Jacket with long sleeves, gloves, head covering, a protective eyewear, face shield, and a face mask head covering. So we do wear like a lab jacket, we do wear gloves, we do wear safety glasses, face shields, and face mask, but a head covering like that scrub cap is not mandatory. When we're dealing with um, with instruments and when we're in the sterilization area, heavy duty utility gloves are great because they're puncture resistant. So if you poke yourself, the glove will protect you. Um, so we strongly recommend heavy duty utility gloves for um, when you're dealing with instruments. All of the following are true regarding gloves except one. Which one is the exception? A. Certain hand lotions can affect the integrity of gloves. B. Wearing gloves replaces the need for hand washing. C. Sterile gloves Sterile surgical gloves are recommended for oral surgical procedures, or D, the FDA has identified glove failure rates for manufacturers. The answer is B. Wearing gloves does not replace the need um, for hand washing. We need to still wash our hands before we wear gloves. And the reason for that is, you know, many people think, well, we're wearing gloves. Why do we have to wash our hands? Well, you can ha your gloves could have um, defects. You don't know that. Like, uh, the gloves could also be torn. <clears throat> when you're using it and now your hands have become contaminated so if you start with fresh clean hands it will reduce the risk of any um because let's say your gloves get t uh, torn when you're working then then what can happen is your hands can get uh, dirty that way and then if you have any cuts in your hand for example the bacteria can get inside so you want to make sure that you clean your hands before you wear your gloves because you don't know if your gloves have defects or not. You don't know if your gloves will get torn during use or not. So always make sure you have clean hands. And the rule of thumb is that if your hands look soiled, so if it looks dirty, wash your hands and then you can use ABHR. ABHR is that hand sanitizer thing, the alcohol-based um, hand sanitizer. Um, but if it doesn't, I mean, we always recommend washing hands, but if your hands don't look soiled, then you can just use ABHR. You could just use the sanitizer. With hand hygiene, um, they make sure you don't wear any, when you're washing your hands, make sure you remove all rings and any jewelry. Your fingernails should be short. The rule is, it, if you look at the, um, the palm, you shouldn't see your fingernails extending from the palm. 
Okay, let's look at sterilization because this is a huge component. So sterilization is when you're killing all the bacterial spores, all the, the bacteria within um, your instruments. So it has to go through a sterilizer like we see here. Now when we're looking at instruments, there are critical instruments, semi-critical instruments, and non-critical instruments. A critical instrument is an instrument that um, enters your body. So think of an instrument that actually goes sub to you, an instrument that actually enters your mouth and, and it enters um, like a body site. So uh, your scalar, right? We go sub G with that. We even go supra, but it, it still enters your mouth and it's exposed to blood. It's exposed to saliva. Um, uh, ultrasonic scalar chips, surgical instruments. Those are all examples of critical instruments. And critical instruments, they have to be heat sterilized. Okay, they must be heat sterilized. Or if you can dispose it, um, if it's like a one-time use thing, then you can dispose it up. Semi-critical. This is where it comes in contact with just the mucous membrane, just saliva, not necessarily blood. So, for example, um, your handpiece, impression trays. So they, they do get exposed to um, mucous membranes. They do get exposed to saliva, but it, you're not necessarily going to sub-G with it. You're not necessarily um, exposing it to blood. So semi-critical, and these semi-critical instruments should also be heat sterilized as well. Okay, so heat sterilized is great. If you know some items could be sensitive to heat sterilized, then they need to be um, thrown away. Okay, so replaced by single-use items. And then non-critical um, items or instruments are those that do not come into contact with your with um, mucous membranes, with saliva. So it's only on intact skin. So for example, your blood pressure cup, that, you know, it doesn't enter your mouth, doesn't enter saliva. Um, your bib chain, for example, you don't put it inside your mouth, right? Or inside your client's mouth. So that's considered non-critical. So how can you remember this? Well, there's a trick that someone told me. Um, if you think of the word C, or sorry, critical has the word C, and think of C for curette. I'll write that down. Curette. So curette is something that you, or you can think of C for cut. C is also something for cut. So something that um, you cut through the mucous membrane, something that, like a curette. A curette is a good example of a critical instrument that needs to be heat sterilized because it has entered the mouth and is exposed to saliva and blood. Semi-critical is, think of semi, S for semi and S for stroke. And the stroke that I'm referring to is just like touch, like a stroke to touch, right? And so a semi-critical just instrument, just like stroke the mucous membrane, just stroke to your mouth. So think of like a handpiece that just, you know, touched your mouth. Think of an impression tray that, you know, uh, touched or stroked or entered your mouth, but it wasn't something critical. It wasn't something as... Um, it wasn't something that fully entered the, the mouth. And then non-critical, non-critical, think of like maybe non-contact, something that didn't touch the mouth at all. So non-contact. So for example, BP cup, stethoscope. Those are things that did not touch your mouth as all, uh, at all. And so non-critical, they can be disinfected with low to intermediate level um, disinfection. So you just disinfect it with the wipes that we have in, in the dental clinic. Now, when we're transporting instruments, do you see how they have like a lid when you transport instruments back and forth? So from the sterilization area to your op, for example, it should be sealed on all sides. Okay, so on the side, on the top, on the bottom, fully, fully sealed. And sometimes, um, actually something that's really good is that when you're done with using the instruments, put them in a, a, a pre-soak, put them in a, what we call an ultrasonic bath. And what they do with the ultrasonic bath is they actually disrupt all the, it's called bio burden, um, all the um, deposits that are left behind, they'll, they'll just uh, get rid of it. All of the following statements regarding processing of contaminated instruments are correct except one. Which one is the exception? Instruments should be processed in an area separate from where clean instruments are, so are stored. Personnel should wear heavy duty utility gloves when dealing with contaminated instruments. Instruments need cleaning only if they have visible contamination. 
or instruments should be heat sterilized unless they are heat sensitive. So which one is the exception? Yeah, if you said C, you are correct. Instruments need to be cleaned to remove the bio burden, the leftover, like the deposits before sterilization. And so we do that when we put them into an ultrasonic bath. And so we clean them regardless of whether you can see contamination or not see contamination. We still have to clean them. Now, how do we sterilize? Well, there are something called autoclaves. Crystal stuff like this, and you um, use typically we use distilled water, right, to um, to clean the uh, or to sterilize the instruments. And um, the reason why we use distilled water instead of tap water is because it prevents any deposits on the instruments. So when we look at sterilizers or autoclaves, there are two different. There's many different types, but the two main ones that are used are the class B sterilizer or the dynamic air removal sterilizer. And what happens here is the air is removed through a vacuum and it sucks out all the air with a vacuum and if you use this type of sterilizer there is a Bowie Dix test that you need to do and I have a, a link of video over here um, so that you can see how it's actually done I do encourage you to watch that uh, there are other sterilizers or autoclaves which is gravity displacement sterilization system where what they do is they use gravity to evacuate the air instead of using um, a vacuum so what happens is they put a lot, a lot of steam goes there, it goes into a really, really high temperature and then you need this X amount of time for it to become sterile. So all the bacteria is gone and now the patient will remain safe. Okay, there are uh, indicators, chemical indicators. So chemical indicators, they tell us whether um, heat has ex been, uh, whether the instrument was exposed to heat or not. So there's something called class five chemical indicators. There's also external indicators, which is like the autoclave tape. So they look like this, but once it's passed through, if you see this, that means that it has reached that, that amount of the correct amount of temperature once it turns black. Um, we can put strips inside our um, instrument you know, in where at least you can see it, where it's exposed. So into our bags where you can see it faced up so you can see. And what you can see over here is that if um, it goes through and it completely goes through and it goes through that blue area here, that means this instrument is now safe to use, which means that the, it doesn't mean that it's, um, it has been sterilized. It means that the correct temperature has been reached. Okay, the correct temperature has been reached. This you can see is incorrect. It's incomplete because it didn't get to the blue area. That blue line that you see should get to that blue area. But to figure out if they actually got um, sterilized, the instruments actually got sterilized, then what we do is we do a BI test, a biological indicator test, which is known as a spore test. And spores are, there's specific microorganisms as we see listed here that um, are very resistant to being killed. And so if they pass the BI test, if they pass the spore test, then we know that these microorganisms have been killed. And so this um, biological indicator test needs to be done weekly however ontario says that it needs to be done daily okay so minimal weekly but ontario if, you, if you're a hygienist practicing in ontario it has to be done daily and so how do you run a bi test well there's a great video that shows you how to run a bi test it's really short i do encourage you to, go, to watch it but what you do is you you put this inside the uh autoclave and then um when you watch the video, it makes sense. But then you put two, you put like the, the test and you put a control as well, which is one that didn't get run through. And then you compare it. And what you want to see is you want it to change color. And if it changes to purple, then you know that it worked. Then you know that all these bacteria or microorganisms or spores were actually killed. The thing is, when you put the file in, it has to be incubated in here for 24 hours. So after it goes through autoclaving, after it goes through... Um, this over here after it runs through here we gotta incubate the bi for 24 hours after 24 hours once you get this pass then you can use the instrument 
Water lines are important to be flushed, so we flush them 20 to 30 seconds in between clients. And at the very beginning, we flush it for two minutes at the very beginning of the day. So in two minutes, you should actually time it. Look at a watch, uh, set, an alarm, set a timer. It should be two minutes at the beginning of the day. Why? Because if we don't flush it, there'll be biofilms inside, right? There'll be like bacteria inside. We need to flush everything out. So two minutes at the beginning of each day and 20 to 30 seconds in between clients. Uh, you know how when we use a section and sometimes we'll get like the client to close on the section that's really bad because if you get a client to close on the section the the, the past the things that have already been sucked in can possibly come out you can get back bow and all the grossing things that went in to the section can now just bounce out so that's why we say don't uh, create that vacuum seal because uh, things can get flushed out okay and so Again, what can we do to limit the spread of infection, to limit the spread of contamination? Well, we can put barriers. We can use a high volume evacuation instead of a low volume. So when we're doing the Cavitron or piezo, use high volume because it can suck out, you know, it can reduce the aerosols in the air and it can suck all the stuff in instead of a low volume. <clears throat> we keep cleaning, we keep disinfecting, we limit our touches. Um, of objects and surfaces, so we try not to touch the drawers, we try not to touch the, um, you know, the counters. If we do, we have to reuse over gloves. When we're cleaning housekeeping surfaces, if we're cleaning sinks or walls or, and stuff like that, um, floors, then we can just use soap and water. But anything that's within the unit, like the, you know, the tray table, the chair, that needs to be um, with the proper. Um, intermediate or low-level wipes. Now let's say you got poked. Okay, let's say so exposure management. Management. This is um, an example or post-exposure management. Let's say you got poked by an instrument or poked by a needle. What do you do? Well, there are steps. Every office should have post-exposure steps. There should be regular training and education, uh, and there are procedures for who you should tell when you got poked and. Um, how, how to get tested and how to be followed up. So let's say you got poked. You were, um, you know, maybe um, you were cleaning, you, your client had just left and you picked up your instrument tray and you were taking it to the sterilization area and you accidentally poked yourself with one of the instrument. Immediately perform first aid. And when I say first aid, what I'm referring to is just wash or flush that area with clean water, with um, uh, don't squeeze the area, don't squeeze it out. Don't squeeze the blood out, just wash it. Then report it right away to an instructor or to whoever, whoever is in your office that is the designated person that is responsible for completing an incident report because there's an incident report that needs to be filled out whenever you get poked with something. Then what happens is that person who is filling out the incident report, they will go to the client and they will contact the client and tell them what happened. When they contact the client, the client will be given the option to take um, blood work so that and that blood work result will be sent to the um, to the designated person to and in that blood work it'll just say whether they are hiv positive or hiv negative whether they have hepatitis or not so they tell you whether they have a condition because if you know that then you can prevent taking medications because then you know you're safe but sometimes we don't know that sometimes clients will disagree and will not want to take that blood or do that blood work so then what happens is you need to go to the hospital and you need to get tested for HIV, Hep B or Hep C. And then um, the doctor will tell you what to do. So let's say um, we say that as soon as you get poked, go right away. Like leave everything and go right away to the hospital. Because if you got infected with HIV, the best the ideal time for you to start that medication is within two hours and no later than 72 hours, no later than three days. So you have two hours to three days, but ideally the sooner the better. So within two hours, you want to go and get yourself um, seen by the doctor. Because if you do have HIV, then you need to start that very strong antibiotic or medication rather. So again, our goal is to um, prevent any, uh, prevent us from getting sick. To end, evaluation of the infection prevention and control program is so important. So every dental office should have a designated infection prevention and safety coordinator, and that person is responsible for making sure that they have um, 
everything in the office to keep everyone safe. So for example, they should make sure that they have enough gloves, enough gowns, and all that, so enough PPE for everyone. They should make sure that they have hand hygiene products, so sanitizer should be available. They should, if there are any safer devices to reduce injuries, so for example, that shielding, uh, needles that we were looking at those are great things to have so this coordinator is responsible for all that so it's really important to regularly evaluate your infection program your infection prevention and control program to make sure that you are meeting the needs of the clients and staff so to end let's actually finish off with this question which of the following is true regarding a dental clinic infection control program evaluation I'll let you have a look and then tell me what you think so the answer is D. If you said both A and B are correct, you are you are correct. So A, you definitely need a method that needs to be out there so that you can make sure that you're reducing the risk of infections between, um, you know, among the, your patients and among your staff. And evaluation is so important as we talked about before. So hence A and B. C is saying an evaluation program does not improve an infection control program. That is absolutely not true evaluation is important um, and it, it, we know ADPI has the E for evaluation so the ADPI is really important when we're looking at a clinic um, setting we're also looking at this over here evaluation is important also with infection control program we always should evaluate it regularly